Okay, well, um, I guess I'll go ahead and get started um, because I only have an hour for this. Um, as you see on the slide here, my name is Shane Kerr. I'm from ISC. Uh, this is a talk about robustness in error handling in Bind 10. Um, so I give a lot of talks about, about DNS. Uh, and normally I'm working in IETF working groups or uh, write meetings. Uh, these are venues where the people know a lot about DNS and usually it's a very short presentation about specific topics, a change in the protocol or things like that. So this is a bit new for me, this, this style of presentation. So hopefully I get the level right. Hopefully it's something that you can understand and hopefully you find it interesting and maybe even helpful in your own projects. So, um, I'm going to go ahead and talk a very short bit about DNS in general. Um, sort of give you a brief introduction to DNS. You probably have some familiarity with, familiarity with DNS, but I think it will be helpful uh, when I start talking about the type of errors that we get and how we handle them, if you understand the context the, of, the, of the software. So um, at the very, very, very basic level, um, DNS is something that we use to turn a name that people understand, www.tidos.org, uh, into a number. This is an IP address. So uh, computers work with numbers. They don't work with names. So we need DNS to do the translation. Um, of course, DNS does a lot more than this. DNS uh, can also go the other way. It can turn numbers into names. It is used by mail systems. It's used, um, Microsoft products use it very heavily for you to figure out where, where the services are on your networks and all kinds of stuff. Um, but this is a good, a good model for the, the very, very basics of what DNS is for. So, right, um, oh, I'm cut off a little bit on the right, sorry about that. I don't know, I don't know what's up with the projector, but um, a DNS query is the basis of the DNS protocol. So. Um, you have different computers on the internet talking to each other. Um, most DNS queries are where a computer is asking for information about a name, usually an address. And it's usually a single UDP packet that gets sent. And the, so here we, I did a TCP dump so you can see what's actually going on on the network during a typical t, t, uh, DNS session. So um, we see here, let's see if I can find my, I did bring a pointer. All right, we see here that we've got this computer at this port is sending to this computer at this port and it's looking for an address for www.tidos.org. And then the computer that uh, it sent it to is sending an answer back and it's saying that this is the address. And then we also see a similar query for IPv6 um, and it says there's no, no IPv6 address for Tidos. Shame on Tidos, but um, that's how it is. So this is, this, is, this is it. This is really as basic as it gets for, for DNS. Um, it uses UDP in general. Uh, UDP, if you don't know about the network and internet, UDP is an unreliable protocol. And that's a way of saying that when you send a UDP packet, you have no guarantee that it's going to arrive at the destination. It's all done best effort, which means that it can fail. With UDP, you also don't know uh, which order the packets are going to arrive. So if you send two or more packets, you don't know that the first packet arrives at the destination before the second one. Um, the second one could arrive first. There is a, another protocol in common use on the internet called TCP, which you're all probably familiar with. Um, TCP does have these guarantees. So if you, if you connect to a computer with TCP, like when you're browsing the web and things like that, um, it's guaranteed, which means that all the information will arrive or the program will get notification that it didn't work. And it all arrives in the right order, so your web page doesn't look, doesn't look funny. Um, the reason DNS uses UDP is because it's a lot more efficient. When you set up TCP, you actually have to make a connection. And so usually you end up sending something on the, like five times as many packets to, this, to do a small, a very, very small query, which is what DNS is, as you can see here. Really, it's, it's just a couple packets. Um, there are times when, when TCP is used in DNS. Um, the main reason you use TCP is if the answer doesn't fit in a single packet, in which case you need to make sure that they all arrive together and that the information is not, not corrupted. Um, um, that's becoming more and more common, but, but, but basically UDP is what, is what DNS uses. 
Right, so um, the things that are asking questions in DNS, we call DNS resolvers. And they're called resolvers because it's used to resolve a name into an answer, usually an address. Um, the, the very simplest type of resolver is called a stub resolver. And a stub resolver doesn't have any logic, doesn't have any, any intelligence to it. All it does really is that, that packet we saw on the previous slide, all it does is send an answer or a, a question to a single address and then wait for the answer. Um, this is, if you look, if you're using a Unix box, you see something called etcresolve.conf. It's called resolve.conf because it's for your stub resolver. And that will usually have the IP address of some machine on your network, which is what's it, what you're sending the question to. Now that machine will usually be running some software which is significantly more complicated. The reason we have stub resolvers that don't do anything is because um, you want it to be very simple. So any software at all that you use which does mapping of a name into an address using DNS runs a stub resolver. So if you've ever written a piece of software and you use get host by name, or if you've used the Perl net IO module, or if you've used Python and tried to connect to an address, a name instead of an address, all of these are using a stub resolver. And that's implemented either using library code or maybe operating system code as well, depending on, on your system. Now, the next level beyond stub resolvers are what we call recursive resolvers. A recursive resolver is a lot more complicated. This is the software that actually has to know how to figure out what a name is in DNS. So I'm not going to explain how DNS works from the logical level, but basically a DNS resolver is the one that will go to the root name server find out where .nl is, and then go to the, the server under that, and to kind of follow the logic down. It will also look at any secondaries you have for your DNS, and it, it really does a lot of work. It keeps caches, so it records information to make it more efficient for later, and a whole bunch of things. Um, and these resolvers normally sit at your internet service provider. Your ISP will have a recursive resolver for all of your customers, all of its customers. Um, if you want to, you can run a recursive resolver at home. A lot of people do that as well. If you have a little NAT box uh, at home, these, these will probably do uh, recursive resolving also. They may also just be a forwarder. Um, so these recursive resolvers receive these queries from these stub resolvers, from these very, very, very simple things. And then they do all the work of actually transla doing, translating that into an, um, into an answer. And the machines that it's sending these, that the recursive resolver is sending to are what we call authoritative servers. So um, finally, we get to talk about DNS servers, which is kind of what we're here to talk about. So a DNS server is either one of these recursive resolvers or it's an authoritative server. An authoritative server is basically just a simple database. So if, you have, if you've ever seen a zone file, it lists a name and then an IP address, and usually often the reverse, these kind of things, and a whole bunch of other garbage which DNS needs to do its job. But at, at the heart of it, it's just a simple mapping. So an authoritative server receives one of these queries with these UDP packets that we saw, looks up in an internal, usually in-memory database. It can also be on disk. It can be anything. Finds the answer and then sends the answer back. Um, so authoritative servers are actually very simple, even though they're kind of the things that make the whole system work. There's also a mode of operation where a DNS server acts as both. Um, I said this is icky. Um, it's, it's, it's not a clean model. And you can see that there's really, not a lot of, there's really not a lot of reason to have them both in one server. The reason they're both in one server are a couple of reasons. One is that everything listens on the same port. So if you're running DNS on a machine, um, all the questions come to a single, a single port. So if you need both functionality and you only have one machine to do it, you have to combine the, the servers and the services. Um, but largely the reason that they're run together is just for historical reasons. That's just how it was done in 1985 and that's how it's done in 2009. So uh, for security reasons, it's not recommended. It used to be a real problem for security to run them both on one machine. It used to be that uh, people writing the software weren't careful about which information was from recursive and which was from authoritative. So you get leakage from one side into the other. And there were a number of security bugs where someone could overwrite your authoritative information by updating your recursive information. Those have all been addressed now, so that's not no longer a concern. But for purity, people, it is recommended you run separate servers. So um, I hope we've all learned something here today. Um, 
Right. Summary, DNS is useful for turning computer names into numbers that computers can understand. Uh, DNS queries are a simple exchange of UDP packets, usually. Um, DNS resolvers are either stub resolvers or recursive resolvers, and a DNS server is either a recursive resolver or an authoritative resolver, or it can be both. But um, this talk isn't actually about DNS. So um, the, the reason that I wanted to talk about, about DNS is just to, um, just to give an explanation of the context in which, um, in which bind lives. Now, I'll talk about bind in a second. But when a, when a DNS server is operating on the internet, it's getting a very high volume, typically. Of course, it can just be a few. It can be a few queries a minute, but most DNS servers receive um, hundreds or thousands of queries per second, which is a lot of packets. And they're all very simple packets, so there's not a lot of state maintained. Um, and this is the environment that DNS servers live in. So that hopefully that will help you understand the the the, the security implications, which we'll talk about, and the um, robustness. Right. So now that I've talked for 10 minutes or 15 minutes, however long, I'll start with some introductions. Um, Bind9 is a DNS server. It's open source software. It's released under BSD-like license, which I see people are now calling the ISC license. But uh, it's, it's, it's an, a relatively open license. And we choose that license to allow you to incorporate it into proprietary products if you want. Unlike the GPL, which you have to release the source, with ISC license, uh, once you once you you can use our software for free, and you don't get the ownership of it, but you have, you're under no obligation to release the source code, and that's one of our goals as a company. Um, it's used on about 80% of the DNS servers on the internet. Uh, this number comes from a number of DNS surveys. We didn't mail people and ask them to tell us which software they're using. We scanned their boxes and saw which software they're using because uh, DNS servers report what, what what they're running. You can turn that off, and security people recommend it, but I don't care. <laughs> it's, not, it's, not, it's not actually a real danger if you, if you let people know which server you're running. Um, and yeah, that's, that's BI9. And I'll talk about the history of BI9 uh, in the next slide or two. Um, now, BI10 is, uh, right now it's vaporware. It doesn't exist. Um, but BI10 is obviously the next version of BI9. And uh, the reason we're writing BIND10 bind is to address some of the architectural problems of BIND9. And I'll talk about that again in a few slides. Um, ISC is the Internet Systems Consortium. We are an open source company. We maintain BINDs. We're writing BIND10. We also maintain um, ISC DHCP, which if you're running a high volume DHCP server, you're probably using. Um, we uh, we run an fruit name server, which is kind of one of the 13 name servers at the top of the internet. We do a lot of open source hosting, so we, we host the kernel.org, uh, we're the secondary of them, maybe even a primary, I don't know. And also the FreeBSD site. We do a lot of open source projects, Mozilla, um, we act as a secondary for them and this kind of thing. Um, we basically do good, good things on the, for the internet. Um, and me, I'm Shane Kerr, as I said in my title slide. I'm the Bind10 program manager, so um, I care very much about Bind10, which is why I'm giving this talk. Right, so history. Uh, this is a URL you can go to. Uh, I guess these slides will get put online somewhere, I hope. Uh, if not, I'll put them on the ISC site. Um, or you can just search for Bind10 history, and this is one of the first, first, uh, first, first links you'll come to. Um, it's not very long. Um, it's somewhat interesting, just kind of telling you the background of the project and where it comes from and where it's going. Um, but I'm not going to talk about the whole history. I'm going to skip the first 15 years of history because Bind has been around for a very, very long time, since the early 1980s. Um, around, around 1990, uh, Bind 9 was created. And Bind 9 was created because of a lot of problems that Bind 8 had. Bind 8 was kind of of the era of send mail, and internet software had a lot of bugs at that point. The internet was going through some growing pains. Um, in the 90s, it kind of converted from a, an academic, 
semi-closed network where people were, may not be friendly, but they're not actively hostile, into, and where there were probably hackers, but they were kids having fun on the weekend, into the internet, more or less like we see today, which is that it's largely a commercial activity, and it's filled with bad people trying to do very, very bad things. Um, so in this environment, bind eight, oh, question? Yeah, this is around 2000 or so, yeah. Um, so Bind8 had a lot of problems, and the, the authors of the software, uh, Paul Vixie and I think Russ Housley, that may be wrong, I apologize. Anyway, they basically said, look, there's no way to fix this. You can't, you can't, you can't add on security later. The design is broken. So the decision was made to start from scratch and write a new piece of software without using any of the old software, and that's Bind9. Um, it, Bind 8 also had some other problems. It didn't scale with multiple CPUs. It was a traditional uh, single processed application and things like that. It was hard to maintain, hard to read. Um, no, no one really, even the authors didn't love it from the moment that it was created. So um, Bind 9 basically had to happen in one way or the other. So because Bind 9 was engineered for security, that was one of the main reasons that it was created. What, what did they do? to make it more secure? Well, as we said, it's around 2000. So they used what, what was kind of state-of-the-art practices for internet server software at that time. Um, they picked C to write it in. Um, the justification of that was that there was no other language at the time that was high performance enough. I don't know if that's true or not. I wasn't around at that time. I can't really say, but that was the justification. My, my suspicion is that the real reason was that the people doing it just loved C and that was what they knew and what they were familiar with. But in any case, that was what was chosen. It was multi-threaded, the model that was chosen. Um, and that was chosen, the, motiv the official reason is to allow it to scale across multiple CPUs. Um, again, the actual motivations are probably a bit more, more subtle than that. Um, it was, this is a sponsored project, and most of the sponsors were big iron Unix vendors. So Sun and IBM and, and I don't know, HP maybe, things like that. And um, they were all pushing multi-threaded programming as kind of the fashion of the day. So that's, that's probably the real motivation for it being multi-threaded. There, no, there was no real in-depth analysis of the needs of the software and how to get good performance. That was just what was chosen, because that's what everyone was doing. Um, it, there, were a lot, there was a lot of attention put to the design of the code and decoding standards, which was not done for any of the previous versions of Bind. Um, so this was this is done, and this actually, anytime you improve the general quality of the code, you also make it more secure. Any bug is a potentially a security bug, which we'll see later. Um, so that was, that was done. And, a strict system of code reviews is implemented, and that's, that's maintained to this day. No piece of code in by 9 gets committed to the, the main trunk without being reviewed by at least one other coder, uh, one other staff member at, at ISC. Um, in addition to that, some of the normal practices, you use change root and set UID to, to kind of put yourself in a more, in a more secure mode of operation. Um, if, there were, if there are system-specific security features, then they're used. Uh, this is in Linux. Linux implements the POSIX capabilities, which is a security model, which is actually withdrawn POSIX standard, but it's implemented in, in Linux, and you can use it to make your, system slight, your software slightly more secure. And finally, um, a, a software technique called design by contract was used for the software, and I'm going to talk about that next, I think. Yes. So, um, oh, you can't see. I have a little Eiffel Tower on the right-hand side there. So anyway, um, design by contract is a software engineering practice that was developed by a gentleman named Bertrand Meyer. And he's a, uh, he's a software engineer, and he works in academia. And uh, he developed a, a software language called Eiffel based on the design by contract concepts. and the background of this is that Bertrand Meyer was, was working in, in a field of um, 
research, which is trying to make software that's provably correct. Uh, so that was his, his focus. So you have a, you're, he was trying to design a language that was both usable for normal humans and also one that you could use to give to a machine which could then run through all the possible permutations and ensure that the correct behavior would pop out. So you, you know you need you want software that you can use to design uh, that you want to use so that you can build jets and and school buses and things like that and have them work. Um, so that's the background, and it's an object-oriented approach, um, which makes it a bit weird that we're using this for bind nine. But I'll talk about that in a minute. In a bit, um, it's the reason it's weird is because C has no objects. C is just a pr functional programming language. Um, a procedural, well, anyway, no object. Um, and the way it works is actually quite straightforward at the heart of it. There's a, a set of different things that you define here. Um, the first is your preconditions. And this is just, at the, at the beginning of every method call, you list a number of things which have to be true. Otherwise, the software won't run correctly. So, for example, if you have a binary search, a binary search, you just look in the middle of a list, and if it comes before that in the list, you go in the first half, and if it comes after that, you go to the second half. And then you keep doing that until you get the answer you want. So it's like, if you have a dictionary, you kind of look in the middle, and then if that's not the answer, you try earlier, and, and eventually you get to the word you're looking for. Um, and, that, and that would be a precondition, is that you have a sorted list for a binary search. A post condition is, is the opposite. That's, that's what a method or a function will guarantee when it's finished to be the case. So again, with a, with a binary search, at the end of your search, you either get back a result which says this, this answer doesn't exist, or you get back the answer you were looking for. And that would be a post condition. That's what the function guarantees to be true. And then finally, you have invariance. And invariants are things which are true all the time. So, um, and this is in the context of an object. So an object has a whole bunch of state that it maintains. It has data about things. Um, so for example, an invariant of an attendee at a conference like this would have a first name and a last name and, and maybe a date of registration. And you would say, for example, the first name must be present. Or you may say it's not present, but that would be the invariant that's maintained. So anytime you're looking at one of these objects, you would be guaranteed that this would be the, the state of the object. So you would say, OK, I don't have to check to see if this object has a last name, because I know because it's always true, because the software maintains it. And that's, that's what you declare in the invariant. And the reason you do all these declarations is that it makes writing deterministic systems possible. You can look at a system and say, OK, is it going to fail or not? Um, that's, that's the idea. Now, the important point of all this is what do you do if the contract isn't met? Um, if you have a nice programming language like Eiffel, then you can run it through a static checker, and it can actually determine before the program runs a single line of code, before you compile it, it can actually determine if it's going to work or not. And it can say, well, this, you, can't, you have to fix your program. It's not going to work um, in most cases. Now, in programming languages that people actually use, you can't do this. You, you certainly can't do this in C. You can't do this in Java and things like that. So if you're doing design by contract in other languages, you tend to raise a runtime exception if you have a contract violation, which basically just says, OK, so your, your, your binary search function might say, oh, crap, this list isn't sorted. I don't know what to do. Boom, your program dies. Um, the assert statement in C, exactly. And, and the, 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 the logic is that if you come to an assert statement and it's not correct, your program doesn't know what's going on. It's in an invalid state. Your programmer has made an error. And you're, you have the best thing to do then is to stop running, because you can't do anything. You don't know where to go from there. That's the philosophy. So that's, that's designed by contract. Um, it does actually work pretty well. Um, it, 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 it minimizes bugs, and it minimizes the harm that's caused when a bug does occur. So what did we do in bind 9? Um, well, as it says on the slide, C is a mess. C is, is, a, is a horrible language. Don't use it for anything. Um, it has unsafe pointers. It has 
unsafe integer types. If you get the signed and unsigned incorrect, you can end up with random values. It, the memory accesses are not checked. Uh, arrays are boundless and all this kind of stuff. It's, it's awful. Um, and for the design by contract point of view, it has no preconditions. It has no post conditions. It doesn't have objects, so there's no uh, invariance to declare about them because they don't exist. So what do we mean when we say by nine uses design by contract? Well, by nine tries to implement the features of design by contract. So we define macros, require, which is basically the same as a precondition, and ensure, which is the same as your post condition, and invariant, which is the same as your invariant. And then insist, which is just another way of saying assert. <laughs> and really, at the end, all of these end up being an assert because there's nothing, there's no exceptions in C. There's nothing that you can throw or, or invoke, so we just have to assert. And what this means is that in by nine, a programmer error, which we try to minimize, but a programmer error causes by nine to exit, um, which is bad. You, you can, yeah, the, the, what the gentleman here is saying you can use long jump. And this is a way in, in C where you can try to fake a, a you, can, you can use it in a manner to try to create an assertion, uh, an, except, an exception, rather. Um, that wasn't done with by nine. Um, yeah. It, long jumps also have the property that they don't, they don't unwind the stack, which I'll talk about here later, which means that your memory can be totally screwed up. And yeah. yeah, because you're using threads, uh, Cancel the threat, which... Uh, yeah. Yes, the, 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 the gentleman here commented that you can use thread cancellation. And the POSIX thread libraries do have ways for you to register functions which get invoked when a thread is canceled. Um, so you could, you could cancel yourself, and then it would unwind the stack, and this kind of thing. Um, and then you would get some, somewhat the equivalent. Unfortunately, bind, eight, bind nine also had the requirement that it had to run on systems that did not support threading. So we couldn't really, it could, it, if, you, if, it, if threading was a requirement, then yes, it could have done something like an exception that way. Um, but by nine at least had the requirement that it had to run on systems which didn't support threads. So you had to be able to do a run in a, just a plain um, NZC environment, ISOC, whatever. Right, so what does this mean in terms of bind, um, bind nine security? Um, this is a URL which lists all the bind advisories. And to be honest, I think it's not too bad. Um, there's been 13 security advisories in nine years, which is more than one a year, which is scary. But I'm going to go through the list here, because there's only 13 of them, and talk about what they actually are and what their impacts were. So I, I classified one of them as a non-issue. And the reason for that is that it was a, there's a function which doesn't check its input. And that's bad. If you give it the wrong input, then it can cause bad things to happen. Um, but this function is not actually used in the bind nine program. It's in one of the libraries that ships with bind nine, but bind nine itself doesn't use it. So as far as the, the, the bind nine software, it's not really a bug, but we decided to announce it as a security problem and, and fix it in the interest of, of making the internet as safe as possible. We had one, one failure, which is we were calling an open SSL function, and we didn't check the return value. Um, yeah. We had one failure, which is a simple program error, um, which is that we, we added an ACL somewhere, and no default was set. It happens. Um, there were two errors which were actually quite serious design problems. Um, one of these is when you send a query, these simple two packet back and forth, you put, a, you put a, a query identifier. Best practice is to make that a random number. The thing that was generating a random number was not safe. It wasn't using a cryptographically secure hash function or anything like that. It was using a high speed um, number generator and that ended up being predictable, which is not surprising. That was a serious error, and that's, that was fixed. The other, that was a design error. That was a bad choice. Um, the other serious design problem is the Kaminsky bug, which you may have read about, which happened last year, um, I believe. Yeah, 2000, I think that was 2008. Maybe it was 2009. Anyway, 
2008 it was. And this is a, a, an actually a problem with the protocol, which doesn't have enough entropy. There's not enough randomness in, it, in these short packets. So someone was able to show that because there's not much randomness, you can actually, um, an attacker can actually uh, spoof an answer back, and that can cause quite bad things. So that was also a, a serious design problem. That one required um, coming up with entropy from some other source other than in the packet itself. And the way that was done in most cases is picking a random port, which is also part of the packet. So even though it's not in the protocol, we were able to kind of work around the lack of, of randomness by, by finding it somewhere else in the system. All right, so those, those are the, the um, most, that's five of our 13. And, and eight of them, eight of our security advisories are denial of service attacks which were caused because you could send data in which would cause a contract failure. One of these assertions, one of these preconditions or postconditions would, would, would trigger. In all cases, it was a programmer error. And what happens is that because of this programmer error, you were able to give it some data from the outside which would cause the program to exit. So what this means, if I remove the non-issue, which I'm gonna do for my calculation here, that means that eight of the 12 security problems from by nine in the, last, um, in the last nine years were actually caused because of this design by contract methodology. Well, they were aggravated, let's say. They, they, they were caused by a programmer error, but, but the result of the programmer error was the program exiting instead of some other, some other probably more desirable um, outcome. Right, so that's by nine. That's where by nine is in terms of reliability. Um, I'm going to talk some about bind 10 now. Now, as I said before, bind 10 is the next generation of bind. Um, and it's an attempt to, gener to address the architectural limitations of bind 9. Unlike bind 9, which is an attempt to work around bugs, um, the problems with bind 9 are not so much that it doesn't work or that it's, it's crap. The problems with bind 9 are that the design choices that were made nine years ago do not necessarily reflect the current best practices in programming with modern computers. So for bind 10, we're going to have all these good things on the list, and I'll go through them quickly. Um, the first thing is modularity. Uh, with bind 9, it's a single program. And even though it's multi-threaded, all of the functionality is built into one program. And this is, this is a problem for any number of reasons. If, you're, if you don't need the functionality, for instance, if you only need an authoritative server, you still get a recursive server. You get all the code that that brings, you get all the security problems that might entail. You also have to figure out how to disable that, and blah, 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 blah. So um, in bind 10, you can run only the functionality that you need. Um, bind 10 will also have well-defined APIs and libraries. With bind 9 today, it does ship with libraries, but it wasn't really designed uh, for third-party people to be able to hack at the code. So you kind of have to really get your head around and really be an expert in the software to be able to change it. With well-defined APIs and libraries, that won't be the case. Um, third point is customization. Uh, this kind of falls out automatically from modularization and APIs. If you, if you have something that you want to do that's less than the system does, you'll be able to remove it quite straight, in a quite straightforward way. If you have some specific function that you want to do that the system doesn't support already, like you have some proprietary database that, um, that you want to support. If you're running some expensive database that we at ISC can't afford to buy the license to to actually port our software to it, well, you'll be able to do it because the APIs will be published and you'll be able to understand them. Um, cluster support by nine, um, because people often have requirements for reliability and for performance that exceed the demands of one box, you have to put it in a cluster. People do this today everywhere, it works pretty good, but you need to have separate software layered on top of it, which um, has implications. It, you can have a weird effects. For instance, if one of your two machines starts falling behind, then you can get different answers when you're querying the same, same cluster and things like that. So it's good to have support built into the software. Better runtime control. Um, right now, if you make a, if you make a, a lot of changes, uh, you sometimes have to restart the software. Um, which, in a, in, a high, in a high volume system, you never want to have to restart. So with bind 10, anything that you can change, you can change at runtime without having to restart. There are, there are, of course, exceptions to this. If you drop permissions to operate in a more secure mode, 
You can't undrop them later. That's the whole point. So in, in these kind of cases, you do have to restart the software. But in general, you'll be able to, to, to do things without, without restarting. And then finally, we're going to be more resilient. And that's, that's what we're here to talk about. So how are we going to be more resilient? Um, the key to being more resilient, oops, I'll go back. The key to being more resilient is to um, um, isolate faults. And by this we mean if something goes wrong, you want it to affect as small a part of your system as possible. Um, there's an, a number of ways to do that, but that's, that's the, the key concept. So the rest of this talk is basically talking about how we limit damage to as small of an area as possible. Right, so the first thing we do is pick a modern language. Now, anything is more modern than C. Well, not Lisp or Fortran or COBOL, but, but basically we have a vast number of choices of possible languages. The, the tricky bit is not finding a new language, it's deciding which of the hundreds of them that we're going to pick. So we had a few requirements. One is that we wanted a mainstream language. Everyone has their own pet language that they love, which they think is really cool. But we want something that we're going to be able to meet people on the street, and they're going to be able to take our software and read the code and understand it, change it if they want, extend it if they want. We also want to be able to hire programmers to work on this who don't, we don't have to spend on six months training them up to this language, right? Ada, Modula 3, all these things. Well, we could get a lot of people in this, the uh, European Space Agency maybe, or, or I don't know, the US, US Army, I don't know. Um, we also wanted C-like performance. Um, it doesn't have to be as fast as C, but um, in, in a lot of applications, I think most applications, performance is important, but it's not critical. Um, Bind, however, runs in core internet servers. Um, it often runs at the limit of the machines. Sometimes people have to run multiple machines in order to keep up with the query load. We're talking of tens or hundreds of thousands of operations per second, um, which is, is a pretty heavy load even for modern machines. That means we're, we're not going to be able to use uh, Visual Basic. Um, and we also need to support exceptions. And um, I, I, I talked about exceptions a little bit earlier, and I'm going to talk about them some more. Exceptions are critical for us in isolating faults. So we have to have a language that supports exceptions, which almost all do these days because they're so useful. So I'm not going to go through the, the details of, of people sitting in rooms and screaming at each other, um, which actually happened before I started. So it's not none of this is my fault. But the languages that were chosen are Python. And we're going to use Python where possible. Um, you see, one requirement was C-like performance, which Python is still a long way from. Um, so Python has all kinds of good things about it, but it doesn't have the performance that we need. And because of that, we're going to use C++ where we have to. Um, now, C++ is also horrible. It can be argued that it's more horrible than C, um, depending on who you are. It's, it, it can be, you can use it to write very, very complicated code that, that's, you can't actually read without reading the entire program. Um, you know, if you use operator overloading and, and things like that without caution, you can end up with a line of code which can actually, you, you don't know what's being invoked when you're looking at it. You actually have to run it through a debugger to figure it out. So we know C++ is evil. However, it is very fast. It can be used to produce code as fast as C, and it supports exceptions, and it has objects. So what we intend to do is, is be cautious about the features that we use use C++ only where necessary. Right, so the benefits of picking a modern language. Um, well, we get objects, and most of the modern best practices for programming are object-based. We also get well-tested libraries. Um, by nine, in an effort to be portable, ends up rewriting a lot of things which exist on a lot of systems. So a lot of times you'll see um, if this functionality is supported, then use the system library. Otherwise, here's our own version of the exact same code. Um, this, this is for all kinds of things. Um, Python, one of the reasons we chose Python especially is that it has such a nice set of standard libraries. It does so much stuff by default. And you can, you can count on it being on system, so you don't have a lot of portability issues. Um, for C++, we will also be using 
uh, libraries whenever possible. So the Boost library, for example, is a C++ a set of C++ object, which is quite excellent. It's open source. It's well maintained. Um, there's a number of other things that we, you can use. There's something called libbv for event handling, which is actually public domain software and uh, very high quality. It's, it's very well maintained. So we're going to use these kind of things to, to, to ensure that we get all the benefit of other people's hard work. Now, there's a cost to using other people's libraries. We know that. Um, if a bug is introduced in the library, then all of a sudden you have a bug in your software. However, on the whole, we think that this, this is the, the right approach. Um, all right. Modern languages also give you garbage collection, which simplifies a lot of code handling. Um, by 9 right now, it uses reference counting to maintain memory, which is uh, uh, it's quite complicated if you actually try to debug it and things like that. It's, it's, it's better at f spotting memory errors than simple al allocation and freeing of memory. But it's not, as, it's not as straightforward as using um, garbage collected language. Now, we have garbage collection in Python. We don't have it by default in C++. We haven't decided if we're going to use a garbage collector in C++ yet. I suspect not, because we're planning on keeping our C++ footprint, say, as minimal as possible. So hopefully it won't be necessary. Um, code is compact and easier to read. The higher level language you choose, the less code you have to write to do simple things. Do you have a question? Yeah. Right. The, right. The, the comment was that, that Python also has a reference-based garbage collector, and, th and that's true. Um, but the programmer doesn't care. <laughs> unless you have certain kinds of references, unless you have certain kind of performance uh, problems, then yeah, you don't care. It just happens. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. That's true. And you also have other kinds of errors. If you, because it's not required by Python that the garbage collector be, be reference counted. So, for instance, Jython, which is a Python implementation in Java, uses the Java garbage collector, which is not reference counting. And so, what ends up happening is your objects get destroyed at a different point in time, which can cause timing bugs and things like that if you, if you port code from one, one, one interpreter to the other. But, yeah. None of these are perfect. <laughs> um, right, and the final thing is that modern languages bring us exceptions. So, um, oh, <laughs> we're jumping into the code. <laughs> the thing about exceptions is exceptions let you handle errors in a more logical place for the developers. So you handle the code in the right place rather than right when it happens. And you don't, well, I'll go into the next slide here, right? So um, I did say C was horrible, but here it is. I hope you can read it. It's always a problem when you're putting source code on a slide that it may be a little too small. So this is a slide to show how you check for errors in a programming language that doesn't have exceptions. So this is C. So this is a very, very simple snippet of code. It just outputs the numbers 1 to 10 in a file. Um, so you open a file, and then the very next thing that you do after you open the file is you check to see if that worked. And if it didn't work, you have to do some sort of evasive action. Then you move on with your program. So we have a short loop. We want to print out a number. Well, a print can fail for any number of reasons, such as running out of disk space or having a disk error, this kind of thing. So if you do have an error, you have to check for it. You have to decide what to do. Well, you probably want to close your file, and you want to remove the, the, the crufty thing that you left around, and then return an error code. And then you, you finish your loop, and then when you're done, you need to close it to flush all your buffers and things. And your close can fail, too. Um, for example, if you're on an NFS file system, this might not have actually done anything, and all the writes actually occurs when you close the file. And then, oh, you may get an error. So then again, you have to, perform, you have to check for it, and you have to perform some sort of evasive action. And then finally, you get to to return your successful result. Now, the, the key point of all this is that your code, the actual code of what you're doing, is lost in your error handling. So it's, it's quite difficult to read and figure out what the intent of the programmer is. So you, what you end up having to do a lot of times is read your code twice. You read through it once to try to figure out what you're trying to do. Then you have to verify that that's correct and understand what's going on. I'm talking about as, as a maintainer, not as the initial writer. and then. And then you probably want to go through it and read it again to make sure the error handling is all done correctly. 
And there's techniques you can use to minimize this using uh, go-tos and things like that, but, but the problem is always there. Now, if we contrast with something with exceptions, and this is, an, this is the same function in Python, the same snippet rather, you wrap the whole thing in an error, uh, in, a, in a try and accept block, and then you open your file, you do the writes, you close it, and you return success. And if anything goes wrong with I.O. in this area, then all of a sudden it jumps to this code at the end and you do the cleanup. So what you see here is that you keep the logic of what the program is doing separated from the logic of error handling, which makes it easier to read the code and it makes it easier to handle the errors. Question? Doesn't make, make the error readable though. It doesn't necessarily make the error readable. That's true. That's true. Um, um, yeah, and this code, this code, well, in this case, for example, you don't know if it's the open or the close or the write that failed. That may be important. In a lot of cases, it's not important. And if it is important, you can still check for that. You can still, and that's ugly too, but, but it's, it's not perfect again. Right. So another cool thing about exceptions, and we talked about this a little bit earlier, is that um, exceptions go up and down the call stack. So this is a little, little bit of code snippet here of how you would do such a thing. So this is C++. Um, this is our code right here. We, we want to call foo, and if something goes wrong, we want to output the error, right? So foo, all it does is call bar. There's no errors going on here, but bar will throw an exception. So the, the thing to notice here is that, is that foo doesn't care about this. This code is completely uncluttered by error handling or error checking at all. Because food will just, if an error occurs, it doesn't care. It, it, it's not important. Yes? But the uh, important part is that, that if you uh, allocate something or change the right. state and then you call bar, then that's you true. don't see that it, it will uh, jump right, right out. Yeah, that, that's, that's an important comment. The comment here was that if you have some state, if you allocate memory or open a file or something like that in foo, then you can't see that it's going to, the that, that bar will, will throw an exception and, and blow up to the top here in your, your, your host. Now, in, in Java, this, it works around this problem by um, if, if you throw an exception, you have to declare it here, and then foo either has to catch it or it has to declare that it's throwing it. So, so, so Java work, tries to work around this problem that you described, which is that you're, you're, you're hiding that stuff. So what, what you have to do in C++ is you have to be a little careful. <laughs> you have to actually know what's going on. You can't just ignore the problem. But the basic, the, basic, the basic concept of having the error go to someone who's prepared to take some action based on it still remains. So if you're maintaining state, you have to do something. Um, the usual way to do this in, in Python would be to declare a block that always executes so that um, it's sort of a cleanup block that happens whether the function ends successfully or not. That, that kind of works around the problem. Um, anyway, the, the key point is that, is that errors come to places in the code where you're prepared to handle them. So this is useful in, especially in low-level libraries. Um, but we'll talk about this in a minute, so sorry about that. Right. I, I, I love exceptions. I call them wholesome goodness. They, uh, they do all kinds of good things. They make the code easier to read. They um, minimize unchecked errors. Um, this is, um, we had one of, one of the bind nine security bugs was caused because we didn't check the return code of a, of a library. Now if that library had thrown an exception, something would have happened. It wouldn't have just gone unnoticed and having strange unexpected results happen. So, um, that, that it, will, it doesn't totally eliminate them because, of course, not all, not all libraries throw exceptions, but it does help. Um, and it ha allows, for me, the key point is it allows errors to be handled as close to the problem as makes sense. Now, you want the error handling to be done as close to the error as possible because that's where you have the most knowledge about what's going on, but sometimes it doesn't make sense. So if you're in a library, you may not want all file errors to be handled in your library, because basically you don't know what to do when there's a file error. You probably want to pass those up. So rather than having to just check for them and then return them, you can let the exception handling actually do that in a much more natural and logical way. Now, 
having said all that, oh, now the important point for this is that design by contract errors are also exceptions. So you can handle those as close to the problem as makes sense as well. Um, now, some care is required. This is not a silver bullet. Um, and I'll be talking more about that shortly. So, right, another way to isolate errors, to do this fault isolation, is to have multiple processes. Um, this is basically running each type for in our context, we're going to write each, run each type of task in a separate process. So on a DNS server, there's a lot of things that you do. You have to maintain the state of the data that you're serving. You have to keep your cache clean. If things are too old, you have to get rid of them. Um, and then you have to actually answer queries. And you have to handle administrator uh, changes and all these kind of things. So rather than running all of those in one program, you run a separate task for each of these. That way, if there's a bug with, within one type of task, it it's limits the impact of that. Now, um, some tasks, we need to run more than one process. For query handling, for instance, we probably will run one process per CPU on the machine. This allows you to scale across multiple CPUs. It also limits the impact if you do have a serious error. Um, because if there's a, serious, a very serious error, the program will die. And having multiple processes means that only a part of your overall system will die, not the whole thing. Now, uh, this is a technique that Google Chrome uses, the browser. Um, and it uses it basically for the same reasons. If you're browsing a web page and something funny happens, then your browser will die. But in Google Chrome, only one tab perhaps will die. Um, and then the rest of your application will continue on in a nice, safe way. Um, now, Google Chrome also has some problems that we don't have. They run code that's been uh, run code that's been written by other people in possibly unsafe environments. We don't have that problem in Bind 10. All this code runs on a server, um, and hopefully the administrator meant for it to run there. So, oh, and I had a little animation here. These are the kind of things that you would see. These are the kind of different tasks you would see. So things getting zone information in, things sending zone information out, um, something that updates the zone, and then you might have a number of these authoritative servers, which are the things answering user queries. And you know, basically, as you'd expect, if the zone update, which is one of the errors that we had, one of the security problems that we had, was that an error in the logic handling someone updating a zone would cause the server to crash. Um, so it's a denial of service attack. Now, in a context or in a, in a situation where you're running multiple processes, well, then your zone update will crash. But you're still answering queries. Any of your zone transfers that are in progress will still continue on. And in bind 10, there's going to be logic to restart that process as well. So um, basically, what will happen is your system will lose the ability to, to get updates for a short time, and the rest of the system will continue on unaffected. So this isn't going to fix everything, of course. Um, none, of, none of these techniques are our real solution. Five minutes, OK. I think this is my last slide. Right, so um, one of the problems is that you have to analyze your code. Uh, you have to, if you're going to use exceptions intelligently, you have to actually think about what errors can occur and how to handle them. So an example is with this update task. If you, get, if you get an update message and all of a sudden your program discovers that it's an incorrect state, you can end the process. That's fine. Um, but for instance, if you discover that you're in an incorrect state after you've already started updating your database, then you may have real problems. You may end up with a corrupted database. And then you have to take other actions. Um, and perhaps restarting isn't going to be the answer to your problems here. So, so you have to actually analyze the code and make sure that, that you perform the best action that you can when you discover a program error. Um, if you're using multiple processes and they restart, there's always a cost. At the very, very, very least, whatever query w triggered the error is not going to get an answer. Now, if you're getting 10,000 queries a second and you lose one, then you don't really care. But, but if you're getting 10,000 queries a second and you have to restart, it's going to take a couple of milliseconds. You may drop some queries, too. So um, there's always a cost to restarting. It's not free. It's better, than, it's better than, than restarting the whole system and having to take a minute to restart, perhaps. 
but it's not not free. Another problem is that shared data does affect all processes. So, um, for example, if you have a recursive resolver, you may have multiple processes, multiple processes running, but they may share the same cache. This is for efficiency reasons, basically. Um, the larger your cache, the more efficient it is, right? But if something corrupts that, then you have to reinitialize it. And that affects all of the processes running. Um, failure at some operations will have longer term effects. Um, I mentioned the problem with databases. Uh, another example is if you're using a secured zone, if you signed it cryptographically, cryptographic signatures have an expiration. If your software fails trying to resign and renew that, then your, then your expiration hasn't changed. And eventually, you're, 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 it will expire, and then, you're, then your computer will no longer be serving data. So um, fit, this doesn't eliminate all the problems with failure. Having said all that, even with these limitations, um, the simple techniques of using exceptions smartly, picking a better language, and, and having multiple processes is going to eliminate large classes of failures. I, I estimate two-thirds of the failures that we've had with bind 9 would have been eliminated. So, right, old techniques for bind 10, we're going to continue the old techniques that we had, design code standards, code reviews, system-specific functionality, and design by contract. Um, in bind 10, we're also going to use modern languages exceptions in multiple processes. And my promise to you <laughs> is that bind 10 will be significantly more robust than, or bind 10 will be significantly more robust than bind 9. And I have, I think, probably like 10 seconds for questions and answers. And before, before I take questions, I'd like to note that bind 10 is a sponsored project and we are still looking for sponsors. So if you know someone with lots of money who loves open source software, please talk to me. Yes. Uh, the expected release date, we actually have a five-year plan. We are six months into that plan right now. At the end of year one, which is six months from now, we're going to release a authoritative-only server. Um, and that will be an experimental release, not intended for running on production systems, but if you want to run it at home, <laughs> it will be available then. And then year three, we expect to have a replacement that you can use four by nine. So two and a half years, basically. Sorry? <laughs> um, I am not responsible for logos or other things. I apologize for that. Um, I'm a company man here, so <laughs> I don't know. Um, we, we haven't targeted robustness in the past, so this is all kind of new for us, but um, yeah. With InfoBlox and Nomino? Ah, right. It, InfoBlox is a company that, I believe they package by 9 along with some other software. Um, so they use our stuff. And when they say they provide robustness, what I suspect they do is give you a configuration that they've checked and make sure it's correct. And they probably also have some um, scripts and things like that, which monitor the system for health. And if something goes wrong, they may restart the software for you and things like that. Um, so that, that's my guess. I don't know. I haven't actually used their software, so that's my guess. Um, for Nominum, I can't say. Nominum is proprietary software. I haven't, I haven't used it. I don't know what techniques they use. Um, Nominum does run on, when you buy Nominum software, they basically tell you what, how to configure your Linux box to run their software. So they, they may have specific configurations that they guarantee um, will provide certain behaviors when, when their software runs. I, I don't know. That's, that's, that's as much as I can say about their stuff. So. I do know that other open source software has not addressed robustness as a serious issue. In this in this way, um, their approach, other uh, open source software approach to robustness in the DNS world is to write good software. To write good software, which is basically the approach that Bind Nine took. Um, so Bind Ten is going to write good software and do a little bit of other stuff to try to make sure that we we do better. Okay, 
Thank you, everyone. Um, we have a booth right by the door here, a table thingy. So if you want to talk to me later, I'll be standing around. Thank you.